or some space-time concepts, actually, to be precise. And um, it all started with the, you know, my interest, actually, in topics of the universe that uh, I found of uh, interest. And I thought maybe in some way, actually, there's a, a, a connection or similarity between space-time and universe concepts and trading. Concepts and trading. So that I, that's the, that's so the whole that's idea. The, that's, that's the whole the origin idea. Of, that's the idea of the topic. origin of, of the idea so of the topic. It's maybe a bit so less interesting than actual trading plan. Uh, actual trading plan. Uh, 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 things uh, last week we were moving average trading uh, plan. This is a bit more abstract. Uh, things for, for, but uh, pre trading plan. plan. This is being more abstract. Yes, I also thank you for being here. Where the echo comes from? Yes, I also echo it. Yeah. Okay, that's cool. Great. So, so not as a, you know, not as maybe as as concrete, a bit more abstract. But I will tell you why I decided to choose this. Although I realized that uh, maybe less people would be interested in the topic, um, but I'm glad you're here. So let's get this show on the road. It's a webinar, of course, hosted by your Admiral Markets. My name is Chris Swarsik. And before we start this risk disclaimer, uh, please be aware that trading for exchanges, of course, carries a high level of risk. And please uh, consult with a financial uh, independent advisor if need be and uh, this webinar is meant as an educational webinar only all right just please uh, pause to read this risk disclaimer and if it's not enough time just to uh, ask animal markets for the entire disclaimer all right so thank you for your attention on that if you want to stay in in touch with animal markets which I definitely recommend uh, Please take a look at the Facebook and Twitter and even Google Plus. By the way, yesterday there was a, a kickoff of the Forex ball. So you might want to take a look at that um, the contest with great prizes. And if you didn't catch this week, it's just you know started yesterday, but if you don't want to start for if you haven't started, there's a new one. So I would like to show you to pay attention to the fact that if you're looking for some analysis, you've got fundamental, technical, and wave analysis all here. Learn more. You can see here all the uh, the info you need to uh, to trade this contest. It's always fun, I think, a contest. So definitely take a look at forexball.com. Cool stuff. And if you're not already using Admiral Markets as your platform, you might want to think about it because you have some cool advantages like market depth, great spreads, and you can buy direct. So let's get the, today's topic on the uh, going. Uh, today's goal is the explanation how to use concepts of energy and gravity in trading. So what we'll be looking at today is kind of a bit of physics and space time. I know it sounds maybe a bit spacey, but uh, that's what we'll be looking at. And we are trying to, of course, translate certain concepts to trading and how we can use that for trading on our charts. Now, I know this is a bit um, maybe theoretical, and I understand that. But let me tell you my goal, except explaining how we can use it. My goal, in fact, is that if you see how certain, certain things maybe relate to, the, to bigger concepts, then, um, you know, because these are space time is, are, are things that govern our universe, so you can't get bigger than that, right? So if you can see maybe the relationship to each other, the, the, the actually the hidden goal of this is to to maybe explain why technical analysis and why chart analysis will will work for you as a trader. Now some of you might have no doubt about technical analysis and why it should work. That's fine. If you do, you know this this might give you even if you do think it works, it, it does work. It I think it will give you an extra kind of confidence in your trading. And as we know, confidence is a very important part. Of uh, psychology when trading, uh, you know there are many elements that we need to balance out to become a successful trader. And um, and, and psychology and having confidence in your trading, and following your, your your analysis or plan, and or plan, uh, you know is, is is key. So if you maybe because of this webinar, that was my goal, uh, you'll get more confidence in in why certain analysis might work. So the analysis we saw last week with regard to how you can trade, for example, the moving averages using the alligator on one hour, four hour, 15 minute chart. Why does those things work? Well, I think that partly at least, I think there could be some, some explanation in this, in, this, in this webinar. It could be just, you know, I'm not sure because it's kind of an abstract topic. So making the connection is, is something of a debate. You could see it differently than I do, right? That, that's for sure. So if you have any questions or comments, please let me know. I would love to hear your feedback uh, as well. Uh, because you know this is not an exact science in my opinion. This is the translation I made from a from physics to, to trading. While maybe you 
have see other connections. And I would be interested to hear that, what you think about it, okay? So some questions before we start. Um, now, am I a physicist? No, I am not, I, I'm a trader. Uh, but I do like you know, these topics, uh, space and universe, purely as a hobby. I like to watch you know, documentaries, so you know, my, my, my knowledge on it is, is, is of an amateur, but a, of an amateur with a, a, a high interest in this topic. Okay? So um, what you might think, if you already have a preconceived clear idea what you're going to expect here, I would be curious if, if you have time to type that in the chat box, that would be really uh, great. We'd be interested in your, um, you know, in your expectations of this webinar and see if those match up with uh, what will be provided. Just out of curiosity. Um, so, in the, in the meantime, that you're typing that, I'll continue. Um, well, basically, just just to give an introduction here of physics, it's it's apparently a part of natural philosophy, um, and it involves a study of matter and its motion through space and time. So. It's, it's connected to concepts such as energy and, and force. Now, we have more of a classical and modern physical physics kind of parts. Classical is more like the everyday life, and the modern physics looks more like extreme, very fast, or, or small. All right? Now, we will be, actually there are four. There's the weak force, the strong force, and the electromagnetism. Magnetism, 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 sorry, uh, which are, and the gravitation, which are the four kind of main topics apparently within physics. I found gravitation the most interesting um, so because I think that that's a kind of I saw the most relationship with trading so I thought that was interesting. Uh, Jackie has a question if the theory you're going to teach uh, goes hand in hand with fundamental analysis apart from technical analysis. Um, well it's maybe the word theory is a bit too strong what I wanted to show you more was like a kind of similarities with what we can find between the world of universe and space-time and gravity and, and trading. So more like to compare and see what we can learn from there and then maybe get extra confidence in our trading. That's kind of more the goal. Uh, and well, basically, yes, I think that the, the fundamental analysis uh, has its own gravity, which I will explain in, in uh, later on, but uh, I think that the, Technicals can explain, you know, you can re read the effects of fundamentals by reading technicals, as most technical analysis think. So, but uh, I do think that there's a driver there, a long-term driver in, in the fundamentals, and I'll explain that uh, later on. So, gravitation is what we're going to be focusing on, and it's connected to a very famous, um, famous theory created by no one less than Mr. Einstein himself. And that's the general theory of relativity. And gravitation is just a byproduct of that. Uh, gravitation, of course, founded by uh, or, or discovered by Newton when the apple apparently hit his head. And uh, that gravitation is explained by Einstein and his, his theory of, um, of uh, theory of relativity. So OK, that's just a, a quick background. Basically, um, space time governs the, the motions of objects in the universe. As we can see, I have a picture of the Earth, and that blue grid there, where you see a dent, that is kind of like represents space-time. So for those of you who know it, you recognize it. If you don't know it, it's space-time is like it's a combination of time and the 3D space levels we have. You know, we have like height, width, and length, or something like that. You know? So um, and, and the space-time is then dented by objects like the Earth, the Sun, meteorites, bigger sun, uh, bigger stars, and the bigger the mass, the more dense it makes in this space time, basically. And the bigger the object, the more, gra like the bigger the gravitational attractiveness is, the bigger the, the strength of that gravitational force is. So that's why the, the Earth is rotating around the Sun, because the Sun has a, a relatively big mass compared to the Earth. So our Earth is small, so the Earth is kind of attracted by that Sun's, sun's mass, right? That's why we're making an orbit, more or less. Uh, it's not a, a precise circle. It does wobble a bit, but more or less. And um, that's why the Moon is also making a circle around the Earth, right? And um, the, when the Earth goes around the sun, it's denting, making this dent within the space-time, okay? So, in any case, 
uh, for those of you who you know are not too much into this, um, we have space has three dimensions, and the fourth dimension is time. Time cannot be separated from the space, space, uh, spatial dimensions. Uh, time is in that regard relative. It depends on your velocity and the, you know the relative. It's relative to each other. It's something that Einstein also discovered, and uh, it. it so there is an inter interaction between the object's velocity and the strength of its gravitational field. Okay, that's basically kind of space-time, right? So now let's kind of translate that, I would think, to to trading. So we have an object's velocity, velocity, and we have the strength of the gravity, which depends on its mass. So let's take Earth as an example. Earth has a certain speed, and and also a certain mass, which has that gravitational force. Okay. So um, we have this, if we now translate uh, that to trading, the object in this case, for example, could be price, right? The Earth, I mean, going through the universe, right? Crisscrossing through space time, it has a certain speed, right? Now, it's going to interact eventually with a, a stars, with other meteorites that are bigger or smaller. It's going to interact with. Uh, with the Earth, maybe, hopefully not, but you know what I mean, uh, other, other planets, and these have either more or less gravity. So this meteorite is hurtling through space, and it has a, uh, and that, that's equal to kind of like to price. Price, if we, if we would look at it to uh, a, a chart, you can see the chart has kind of like, my drawing tool is not working properly, but if, if we have, you know, we know that, of course, price has a D, D. In that regard, maybe the chart is like our universe. Right? We don't have four dimensions, we don't have two dimensions though. Right? That's the difference, but still, it's like our universe. The graph is our universe, very simple. Okay? And uh, in, uh, the, 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 everything inside is basically everything in space time, kind of everything in that area. And the price is that meteorite, kind of. No, you don't see any chart. I can just go quickly to a chart, it makes more sense. Uh, let me quickly grab a chart. I'm at the bottom, right, and, 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 and space kind of right. On the right side, it's only one-dimensional in this case, but you get the point. And um, this is our space-time, and basically, going through this space-time, this, this, this whole thing is kind of like the universe first. It's our universe. The graph is our universe. It's our space-time. And, and the meteorite, is, in this case, was going up, the upward moment, movement, and down, right? So as we know, all objects with mass in space-time are making like a dent in space-time. And as price goes, it's actually making a dent in this space-time and it's choosing the path of least resistance. So uh, that's actually what the Earth does too, least resistance because, and it's making there for the path of least resistance is in this case the orbit of a circle. In the case of the meteorite, the path of least resistance could be something like this, right? Depending on what objects it bumps into. So I think the meteorite is the best kind of like, someone actually uh, introduced that to me, this concept. I was comparing it to the Earth in the past, but someone actually said meteorite is a better example and I agree because the, the price is actually behaving a bit like a meteorite because it's going like this. Meteorites are, uh, meteorites, I'm not, I don't say it correctly, meteorites, uh, meteorites are, um, have the same path, it's, you know? So price is also looking for the path of least resistance and that path was, was this, for your dollar apparently, all right? So let's go back to our, uh, to our PowerPoint. So, we have the object velocity, which is the speed of price, I was thinking, and the strength of gravity, which is actually the relationship of price to, to fundamentals, but also technical analysis tools. So that's the, the, the translation here that I, I proposed. I have no idea if that makes any sense. I thought it could make sense, uh, but if you have other ideas, let me know. I thought that the, Look to me like you know you could compare that those things with each other. So if we use that as our uh, meteor, meteor, okay, <laughs> yeah, I, I'll say meteor. It's a lot easier <laughs> to to uh, to say that word. So if we if we use that as our basis for this whole idea, let's continue with that um, you know that link and say what is the speed of price? And in that regard, it's not maybe a shocking news to you. It's actually the pip movements per time unit. Basically, something very simple. If you look at the last five-hour moves and you see that the and you see that the swing high, swing low, move 25 pips, then we have apparently a speed of 25 pips an hour. Very simple, actually. In a way, it's some it's kind of like price action reading or some impulsive uh, you know, impulsive readings. But you could 
even measure it so precisely that you just take the swing high, swing low, and, uh, and start measuring it. Now, we do the same actually for driving. If we start at point A, at the zero point, and we drive 50 miles or kilometers an hour on average, and we get a point B, and we do that for an hour, then we're, you know, we're 50 miles further, right? Um, but if you take the last part, the second half, the average speed could be 75, while the first part could be 25, and the average is still 50, right? So it depends, all depends, what your speed of car travel all depends on how, what you measure at what time. You can have a one measurement point, like the police does, and if you're a few, few kilometers to, or a few, few miles too much, then you get a fine. Uh, you know, so it all depends on what you measure. What is your starting point? What is point A and what's point B, right? Yeah, with car speed travel. The same is true with, with, uh, with trading, but in this case we'll use logically, most cases would be logical to use swing highs and lows to measure the speed of price. Uh, so in that regard, uh, that would make the most sense when we have the top or bottom, we can calculate um, the speed of that move, which would make sense. And within that move, you can zoom down to lower time frames and see if there's swing highs, swing lows within that time frame, and then you can measure you know, that speed within those, you know, those swing highs, swing lows within the bigger swing highs, swing lows. So you know, that would make sense, I think. Now the strength of gravitational field, uh, as I said, it's the price movements around or towards fundamental data, so this is feedback for, for Jackie who asked that, or technical analysis such as big trend lines or moving averages or anything else you see in the chart, right? Now I do think that on a longer term point of view, you know, there is a reason why the euro dollar, uh, you know, doubled in value uh, from beginning 2000 to 2008. And I think that is a fundamental reason behind it. You know, the, we know that the quantitative easing, the printing of money, inflation, uh, imports and exports, trade balance short, in short, capital flows, uh, equity markets, they all influence, of course, the balance of currencies between two countries. And in the long run, um, you know, I did, the, the reason for a currency to, like a year from now or five years from now or ten years from now, to be at a certain point is, I think, driven by that. Right, but these forces. So that's the gravitational pull. But I do think that um, the interpretation of that fundamental data is definitely possible by analyzing price action using technical analysis tools. And I do think that uh, certain tools ha create a certain gravity on their own. And I think the higher the time frame, the more impact these tools have um, on the currency. Because a weak chart trend line or a weak chart fib would have a, a bigger pull, but also a bigger reaction to it, kind of, um, than maybe a one minute, right, or a five minute, or even an hour, of course. So in that regard, the bigger the time frame, the more mass it has. It's like a weak trend line is like a big star. It has a big mass. It has a big influence, uh, big gravity, kind of. But a five minute trend line is kind of in, re in relationship to uh, like the universe is maybe like a small meteor or it's uh, a very small a Pluto planet. It's not a planet anymore. It's uh, like, like a Mercury planet. It has a very small mass and effect of a small trend line on, on the meteor is going to be small. Why? Because the mass is small. So if you have that mental picture in your mind, big trend line, big star mass small trend line, small star mass, or, or small planet mass even, and it will have less influence on the tra trajectory of price, which is equal to our meteor. Um, so if we, if we this is actually the conclusion, if the speed of price is, is high, basically that gravitational force is going to have less effect. If the force will have more effect, and um, the gravity has, has more effect when the mass is bigger. As we know, the, sun is, is, the Earth is going around the sun because the sun has a bigger mass. So the, not only the speed of the meteor or price movement, the power of the price movement, has, uh, is, is one factor, but then the second would be the, the mass, and that's connected to the time frames, as I just said. So the more mass, uh, the, you know, the more gravitational force it's going to have, the more impact it's going to have on the movement of price. So that's the conclusion basically 
for the trading. So you, if you, I don't have that table, but basically what you could do is make a graph like this, or, or sorry, table, S here, speed here, low speed of our, we're talking about the meteor, our, 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 the price or the meteor, right? We're talking about price. Speed is low or speed is high. Mass is small or, uh, or big, let me do it this way, or large. Price is going to be a high effect on price. But if we have a high speed and low mass, right? That's a scale like that. So that, that would be the philosophy behind it. And um, in, in that regard, um, you know, it's, it's something that you probably already are, you know, aware of or you thought of. But if you translate it, if you, you know, with this link, I think you can see why these concepts work as well as in a trading environment because they're actually just a very natural phenomenon in how other bigger objects in the universe interact with each other. So that could explain why they, why they work with each other here on a chart. Could be. So if you look at, first of all, the speed of price, which is, um, for example, here we see uh, I measured three legs here on the Euro-Dollar four-hour chart. And we can see that if we take this swing high, swing low of these three moves, that there's something like 20, 24 pips per candle. That's the, that's the speed, 24 PC. <laughs> and uh, the second move had 174 and 8 candles, which, which is a bit less. That's 21.8. And then the last one had 169 and 9 candles, which is like 18.8, apparently, um, pips per candle. So you, know, you can see that the speed of this move is decreasing as we're moving up. So as the speed decreases, um, the gravitational the gravitational pull of uh, of these technical tools, for example, like a 50 EMA or a 200 EMA or 100 EMA, whatever you want to use, or a trend line, are going to have effect because eventually, you know, speed is dying, it's decreasing. So as we know, then the gravitational gravity is going to kick in sooner or later, uh, and its the price is going to gravitate back towards towards that mass, right? Now then, once it does this, um, if there's a higher time frame, that example, a huge something here on a higher time frame where price is trying to reach, and after this retrace, it will keep on going up because the pull of this higher time frame moving average or whatever, trend line or fib or whatever, this is actually the higher gravity and then it will keep on going north. And in that regard, this was just a retrace and it will keep pushing up. If, uh, if there's nothing, if, if the, actually the move to this level, then uh, this is just the first part of the downside and will continue down, which is actually its down move all the way to 130 as we speak. So that's, of course, that will be, have to be, that's a question of a higher time frame because this is a four-hour chart, and once we are above 100 EMA and above trend lines and we're moving up to the upside, we can keep on moving to the upside for a long time. It's called a trend, but eventually the trend is going to bend, and we can see that it's, it's eventually going to be making a retrace which is equal to the, the price being gra gravitating towards these objects. Then after that, it really depends on the higher time frame what the higher goal is if it continues or not. Uh, someone has a question here. Valerie, thank you. I will quote it. I will quote the question now. So in a downtrend, the speed is negative. Isn't that the same as decelerating? Well, it, not really. What, what I would do in a downtrend in that case is that if you have a swing high, swing low like this, and it moved down 80 pips, nine, nine, um, nine candles. I don't think you have to work with minus or plus. In case, you can take the bottom and subtract it from the top to get a plus value if you wanted to. Um, if, you're, if you're keen on getting that plus value. We're just looking for plus values so that we can measure the values with each other. Um, so Valerie is saying, so all in all, you're just measuring the speed of price. Yeah, it doesn't matter really uh, the direction. Indeed, it doesn't matter if it's just the, the speed it, it traveled in, in one direction from a swing high to swing low, indeed, um, just to get the speed of that, that move. Exactly, Valerie. So we can always use plus values. So, but I mean, if this is, you know, if you don't want to measure this, of course, you can if you wanted to every time, but it takes some time to, to do this, right? So if you don't want to, I can imagine. That's why, of course, we, we have um, some momentum tools we can use, like the MACD, but uh, in, if, if you're really keen on the more precise measurement, maybe you could do this instead if you, if you, if you like to. And, 
test it, of course, first in any case before you do anything else with that. So, um, so I think that you can use this, indeed, value is asking if we can use the speed of price and tie it into the momentum in stochastics. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I mean, that's why we have those momentum indicators. So if you only use the indicators that you use, that makes sense. And as I said, this is more of a reinforcement of and giving more confidence of, of why these tools work more than anything, right? It's more kind of to show why this stuff can work, not, you know, in a way, maybe giving a, a new insight here or there if you think, if, if you see so, hopefully. If not, then no, no problem. But that would make sense to me. So, as I said here, I wanted to show you how you can use, for example, an ADX or a MACD as well, besides just counting the pips here, right? So, so you can see how this euro dollar is up move, this, uh, in a way, three, uh, three move up like this, right? That after these moving averages, and um, was going down, 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 and eventually uh, the, the, the speed here was decreasing. We had also divergence. Um, the power and the momentum and the strength was was lower. And then, because the speed was decreasing, the gravitational flux became too much for the speed to handle. It couldn't sustain its path, and it was the these objects attracted price to it, right? The meteor could be attracted by, the meteor's path, meteor's path is changed by the presence of a planet. Did that happen? Because that was fulfilled here, but in fact, the whole trend changed, and that's because of a higher time frame, because of a force, and the uh, price actually uh, now used these, these objects as a bouncing spot in a way, while you retrace back to the same objects, but then as a downward retracement for another up move, as you see. Right, so then we eventually made this move, and uh, objects until we lost some speed here again. Made a move, we made one more move up. Actually, this was uh, until beginning January. The screenshot. So, actually, when this move was made, and because I was measuring actually the velocity that the euro dollar made on the week chart was so high, the power and momentum of this move on the weak chart, the, the, pips, the pip size it made this correction, uh, the chance of another up move was so likely just based on that. That was just such a shoe in that the euro dollar would continue for one more move to the upside. Um, we got a question here from Jay, thanks. If we can explain what happened yesterday on the dollar yen, we certainly can take a look at that, no problem at all. I think we're about to finish our at the charts. Um, just, oh, I have some explanation here, just let me, finish this a few more minutes and then we'll go into that. You can see price has high speed in these areas where these black boxes are and price slows down as it moves too far. And what you know one way of measuring if price has moved too far is really the ADX, a very simple, very simple tool of a very, very nice indication where uh, you know above 50 where you have to be more careful and here it reached in 70 where you know the level that the likelihood of a continuation is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. It's all about kind of you know, chance, it's likelihoods, of course, and probabilities in that regard. I think it's 100% where it just topped out and, uh, and then started to uh, move down. So, um, start, and the gravity plays no role, but as the speed plays down, slows down, the gravity plays a bigger role, right? Just yeah. down, makes that retrace, and then it's ready for, for another move up, right? So, when we're, in, when we're in this move up, within this move, right, this is this move, we can easily go down to the one hour chart and buy it for this up move, right? As I've been explaining last week in our moving average um, strategy plan, right? So, oh, oh shoot, I lost the entire second. Valerie is asking if we can give us the exact parameters of the AD, AD, ADX indicator that I'm using. I'm using just the, to be honest, I'm just using the basic settings. I didn't change anything. Uh, but I guess if you play around, you might find values that are better. No idea. I, I never, I'm not um, really too keen on uh, optimizing those things because I, I treat more trading more as a, I have certain things, tools I use, but I'm not that much of a, a black and white trader. I, uh, I use a lot of discretion in my trading. So I don't, I don't really tinker around with those things because I used to maybe a few years ago, but not, not, not anymore. So I just use the basic standard. Values. Uh, Nail is asking which indicators are you combining the most? I like the, the ADX 
um, and uh, otherwise I use a knife D most of the times as well. Those two basically. This is the last slide. So the gravity price sample of any tech any technicals, you know, fibs, anything you use, they kind of gravitate towards that or orbit around it, whatever. Uh, velocity is uh, is so you know you can use these tools like DRDX or anything else you use, or indeed actually count the pips per candle, and there's a direction of force, and I think that force is the long-term economics, but also the traders and the market psychology, and that's why I like Elliott Wave, and I know that for some most it's 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 frustrating Elliott Wave, but that's where I base my my strategy and my trading a lot on as an explanation of the directional uh, direction it can take. But it doesn't mean that I actually take trades based on that wave. It's for me to gain an understanding of what the currency is doing and what it might be doing, and it, you know what kind of behavior it, it can d display. Because that wave is my filter for translating the traders and market psychology, and that is the direction of force behind, together with the long-term economics. So that's how I, I view the market. All right. The end. Um, what the pound dollar is doing in the meantime. Okay, so let's change the the background here because I think a white setting is white bear one moment bear with me for one moment there. That's red, I don't like it. And I like to see candles. Cool. So here we are. The end. Well, uh let's just have one more comment here. Uh Temi Lolula says that uh, I use MACD two but it repaints and that ain't good. Uh, repaints, not sure, repaints, not sure what you mean. Well, what you can also use, what I like too, instead of the MACD, is the, for example, the awesome oscillator from Bill Williams. I, I never had that repainting. I don't know if MACD repainting, but you can use it, take a look at that too. That's pretty cool uh, as well. Um, so that's something that, you know, you could take a look at if, uh, if you like, and maybe you like this one more. All right? So the yen, um, the yen would respect this level here and uh, I to you know I'm not saying that now <laughs> because it's easy to say but I actually wrote it in a column of mine a few weeks ago actually when it was approaching uh, here in this area I already said it and I did expect the high likelihood that it would pause really I have proof I have a column <laughs> dated back from that time so don't doubt about it and um, um, and the reasons why I'll tell you now Okay, Tema Temaluya is saying that it it's it gives a signal at first and all of a sudden it would change it. Not sure which signal. And it act what kind of signal are you so that I understand what uh, what our fellow trader is uh is talking about. Where is it? Uh, uh, no, moving average, I'm not looking for moving average. MACD oscillator. MACD, sorry. MACD. Like a red arrow? I don't have any arrows. I don't know what those are. You have to find out what someone in the group here um, has those errors as well. You know, I don't know, but I don't have them, so I, I wouldn't know. Sorry, no that. So, yeah, fractals. Neil says in there in uh, the last webinar, Bill Williams has a lot of cool indicators. So definitely take a look at that. Not only awesome oscillator, but fractals. I really like those indicators. I'm a big, I'm a big fan of Bill Williams. So um, yeah. I like that uh, those tools. So the reasons why I saw at the um, month chart and I expected uh, I actually after this actually here I expected already that the power of this down move was dying. All right, so let's use our concepts and the gravitational force. The objects were were here. I mean, they're definitely to the uh, higher. Because looking back at this chart and in, in the past, I mean, this is very low for the yen, and it has moved quite far. And, and the speed is, is uh, let's let's add actually a moving average. So we got that confirmation. Let's add a 50. You can see that this object is going to have thinking that here. Now these things on a week chart take a long or month chart take quite long to unfold. So um, I did need some patience before that happened. I already actually was expecting it a lot earlier. This is going to happen and in 2011. Uh, it took a bit longer than I expected, but um, Eventually it did, and we did get the full first impulse with wave as a wave two at a, a, a bigger moving average, 200. So it was high in this up move because it just 
it's correcting and it's a huge swing high, swing low, and that's why there was so much power to that upside because there's a lot of space to the upside. What was important was this 382 and this swing high, this, this swing high, the smallest swing high, swing low on a weak chart. Around I thought that in that area, that's where this burst of momentum could see some pops. So that's re those two reasons uh, why I thought, three reasons actually, this swing high, swing low on a weak chart. Uh, the 382 of this entire swing has been um, on this first initial up move here, uh, and we change, we add one value. I just add a minus one, two, seven, two. Oh, I don't have the dot here. Ay, 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 ay. Minus one, two, seven, two. If we add that, we can see that that was another target. Right here, after after wave two, right, we had an impulse, poked back to 786, just below it, almost touched the lower uh, fib, and then we had a move. The target is the 1272. In many cases, two to a wave three, it can be. So that was the third thing. Think so, to be honest, I I definitely think that we could actually be retesting this top, but it's not going to happen now. I think that this area will be respected. We're going to see a hook back, and then probably continuation after this hook back. How far it's going to go? That's a bit difficult to tell. It's too much in the fifth, or is it going to be one wave to the 50 fib? That's a bit too far to tell, to be honest, for, for, for my crystal ball, <laughs> kind of. But uh, I wouldn't be surprised that eventually we'll be caves before we get there. That time factor is a bit, um, that's a bit unclear in my opinion. But what I do think is clear is, is a move down and then up to this 50 fib move. And that's also the 100, the equal 100 psychological number. So that's something I see quite to see on the day chart, and on the week chart, and on the four hour chart, and the week chart, how price is behaving, what the strength is at the 55th to see, to get an indication, can we trace, you know, those, those things then, then the path of least resistance kind of becomes a bit more dodgy to predict in my opinion because it's just, yeah, it's just, it's just we have to see how price reacts. Uh, so if we then look to a week chart, you can see uh, it took a bit of time, but eventually it did, uh, it, it did so what happens, what are we looking for now? I really think that, in my opinion, so uh, hard. If you know, if you know Elliott wave, we shouldn't break back and it's normally shallow. So I think at 382, actually, the currency bounced off 236 to the pip here, right here at 382, which is around around 88ish, back up basically to the 100. And you can see that there's a nice confluence. So something like this, I think maybe uh, still one more move up, then down, and then and then maybe like up. I would say this is the like, most likely path for the dollar yen at this moment. And of course, you know, I do uh, change my analysis from time to time depending on new factors. Uh, but uh, I can still proudly kind of say that uh, most of the time it does uh, more or less add up. And uh, you know, if 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 something doesn't uh, do what I expect, then uh, then it's time to adjust my trading plan and my analysis. If we if we look at the day chart, then I st I still think that actually we're looking at here. On a one, two, three, is this? We can be here for a substantial part of a lot, length of time. I'm not too sure of that. I mean, this could be just a smaller way four, of a, not a way four of a day week chart, but of a day chart. In case you know, we would probably bounce off these these bottoms here. Uh, eventually, maybe after we pull up a bit and then down, because this level two could be as a support, and we can get, as I said, the path of the least resistance. I envision on. Um, on the dollar yen, and you can see that you know it was the dollar. The dollar yen was uh, definitely attracted by a high gravity here with a huge force. We can see that that up move, which was attracted by a huge force, on the higher time frame, the price started to die out here and uh, it lost its speed, and that's where the gravity of these objects started to uh, to kick into force, and we got indeed the move down back to the 15 MA. Now I'm not saying it would necessarily go down to 200. That's not it. I'm not necessarily saying. I'm not necessarily saying or indicating that that will happen. Just uh, you will have to, of course, decide which factors, which tools you think are useful for your analysis. I'm using this 382 fib. That's actually my gravitational. That's the gravitational force I'm expecting the currency will go to. All right. I have another question of from Team Aloluya. Thank you. Uh, how can I measure the volatility of a currency pair in order profits? I use uh, our home. If you are to do a swing low, so one of the targets, if you would have taken, a, if you were lucky enough to take the 786, one of your targets could have been this referral. 
The other uh, way of doing it is actually what I use is fib targets. If you would have fibbed this swing high targets, extensions, fib extensions, right? That's what I would use. All right. So we have still six minutes left. Um, so I think it's about time to, to ask if you have some questions, um, which I maybe can still hand, uh, answer within the, these, these few minutes. Um, if you have anything that's unclear or I would like to know more about this dollar yen, but this is my vision on the dollar yen. Personally, by the way, I'm not looking so much to sell it. Um, I'm more looking to buy it when it gets to that retracement fib. Expect more downside. I will use it for the crosses like the EJ and the pound yen, which I like to sell uh, or trade more than, than selling the dollar yen because the dollar yen moves quite slowish. And the upside is definitely a strong trend, so I don't mind to buy it. But this this downside, it could be a corrective pattern, which is very you know goes up and down a lot like this, and I don't want to be stuck in that mess. Kind of. So I'm not looking to sell it. By the way, it, this is just the, I, this is analysis. I'm not trading myself the downside. I'm not trading. I'm really waiting. I'm going to be patient and wait either for a break of this top, and wait for 382 at some price action candlestick reversal patterns on a day or four hour, and then take it long. So one of the two. Otherwise, I'm not trading that analysis. But it's, of course, I do do still now and analyze it. Uh, let's see. We have two questions. That's great. What are key elements of trading journal? Well, those are your psychology, your analysis, uh, why you took the trades, uh, what happened after you took it. Did you have any emotions going through your mind? Uh, did you have th thoughts to change the trade? Why did you have those thoughts? And did you did you act upon those thoughts? Did you uh, then after that? Did you, if you changed it, was that a positive? Did it actually help the trade, or did it make it worse? Uh, and write that down. What was the result? If you didn't, would if you would have changed your plan, would have been better or worse? Uh, trade details of, of price, entry, risk, month, uh, daily results, session results, uh, all kind of risk management factors. Those are the things you can put in your trading journal. And then there's another question. I uh, missed the parts of this. I missed the post parts of this webinar. Are you going to hold another webinar soon? Oh, the person left. Okay, well, uh, always measure price speed for equal time frames, or depends when the move ends. Um, I use swing highs, swing lows, but um, in, because those are, I think, the most logical A, A to B movements we use for driving, kind of. So that's the the boundaries I'll be using for my trading. But maybe there's value in using certain measurements. I don't know. I never looked at that. But if you want to do some testing, I mean, why not? But um, I think that the swing highs, swing lows make more sense uh, because that's the natural playing field the currency gives to us are the swing highs, swing lows. And Rai has a question, which indicator gives more information about resistance labels? Resistance labels.